Shalom Aleichem. Hi. Welcome back. Uh, letter number 11. Wow. Here we are. Um, we've been getting a lot of feedback at our website, 30letters30days.com. And I want to just talk about some of the feedback we're getting. Some of it is good news about events that are going on. As mentioned many times in the past, there are groups of women. This share is online. It's for everyone who wants to learn, men and women. But there are special groups of women all over the world who are complementing or uh, supplementing the online share with live meetings and getting together and discussing the letters and what it means to them. We had a group in Boston had an event with women and girls of all ages uh, earlier this week. There was a group in Morristown. Actually, uh, they're getting together uh, each week. They, mean, they got together last week, and this week they're going to get together uh, next week and through the 30 days. In Pittsburgh, there was a group with 87 people, and uh, someone from the group reads a letter every day, and they uh, discuss it in groups. Uh, Philadelphia Hader staff is all together learning uh, the the letters, and every few days they have a question in the teacher's lounge, uh, and they have a, a discussion about a question from based on, on the letters. Also, Detroit High School alumni, uh, they're getting together, and somebody recaps every single day what the letter was, and then once a week they meet together and discuss. So those are just some of the groups that are getting together. And if you want to lead a group, let us know at 30letters30days.com. Also, we got some mail, some questions. Let me see if we can deal with some of it. We got uh, a number of very serious and deep questions. And I'm not sure if we can, I'm, I'm actually, I am sure we cannot deal with all the questions that came in, but uh, maybe we can deal with more than one. Let's see how quickly it goes. <laughs> um, Here's an email based on tonight's letter, number 10, <clears throat> meaning they wrote this uh, letter yesterday, I guess, after, after this year, about writing to the Rebbe. Remember last night the Rebbe was saying how much he wanted people to write to him. I have a question that maybe you can shed light upon. I know how, it impor uh, how important it is to write to the Rebbe, and I know that whether you send it to the oil, place it in the igris, etc., the Rebbe always finds a way to answer you. The Rebbe vek kefin in a veg. Okay, I should actually explain what this person's referring to. Um, maybe I'll explain it at the end of their, their email. Uh, however, I want to know how someone could feel motivated to regularly write to the Rebbe when confronted with the cold, hard fact that we live in a post gimel Thomas world. How can one be motivated to write to the Rebbe, ask him life-changing questions, etc., when even if part answers can be strung together in other ways, the writer knows that they won't receive an answer in the form of a letter from the Rebbe addressed directly to them. I know it's a harsh question, but it's something I'm sure others struggle with as well. With a bracha that... That was the Rebbe's wording last night, even though sometimes the answers are delayed. There should no longer be any delay, and uh, that is, that's the question. Okay, so, yeah, first of all, let me explain a little bit of the question, and in, in the question is actually a lot of the answer. <laughs> The one who wrote the email said, I know there's this concept that Rebbe can fit in a veg, but it's still so hard. Um, let me explain what that is and then also offer that back to the questioner as at least a partial answer. This is something that the Rebbe himself said to uh, Chassidim after Yud Shvat, after the Histalkus, the passing of the Rebbe's Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe. The Rebbe said that just as before, you would write your questions to the Rebbe in 770 in his office. So too, today, you'll send a pan, you'll write a note, and you'll bring it to the oil, or you'll send it to the oil, to the resting place of my father-in-law. And the Rebbe will find a way how to answer you. So that's something that the Rebbe said about his father-in-law after Yud Shvat, after the, the Friedrich Rebbe's passing, that people should continue to write and send their, their letter to the oil, and the Rebbe will find a way to answer you. So I know you're quoting this in your own letter and saying, I know the Rebbe is going to find a way to answer, but still, how do you motivate yourself? And at least in part, what I would say is let's stop, let's slow down, and let's just meditate on those words for a second. Because I think if we really took them in earnest, 
and we would allow them to settle, allow those words to just sink in a little bit more, you might have all the motivation you need right there. Just a suggestion. Sometimes what I'm saying is we don't lack the information that we need. We just haven't chewed and swallowed and absorbed and metabolized the information and allowed it to become part of us. So I think in your question itself, you have an answer. The Rebbe said about his father-in-law, after his father-in-law's passing, that people could continue to write to his father-in-law and the Rebbe will find a way to answer. Now, <clears throat> I will add something, which is, as we mentioned in the very first class, when the Rebbe was pushing that the Igris should come out, um, the idea was, and this is something that the Rebbe agreed was, uh, was an idea, that it was in place of accessibility of Yechidus. In the, in, the, in the later years, it wasn't like it was in the early years where people could have so much access to the Rebbe for one-on-one -on -one guidance. And as we mentioned, uh, what it says in, uh, in the Mave <clears throat> to Helig Yud a base of, uh, of uh, the Igris, that there's this concept that like the Alter Rebbe wrote Tanya, and even though it's only a book, and a book is no substitute for one-on-one -on -one personal guidance, but... The Alter Rebbe said that Tanya can affect that, can have that, can have that effect. And so too similarly, um, the, the, the Igris, they have a similar uh, function in conjunction with, and we mentioned this in the beginning of the first class, Asei Lecharav. You cannot, you cannot forget Asei Lecharav. First of all, Asei Lecharav is a Dvar Mishnah from Pirkei Yavis. It says it twice, actually, in the first paddock. You have to have a rabbi, and a rabbi means somebody you can go to and talk to, a mentor, a guide. It doesn't, it doesn't mean literally a paisik, although obviously you have a halachic shaila, you have to ask someone who's able to, to paskin. <clears throat> but a seil harav means in life, in, in, in just general day-to-day -day living. So remember that these two things go together. You have to have a mashpia. You have to have a personal spiritual trainer to consult with. So between having a rebbe and knowing you have that spiritual connection and also having somebody who you're accountable to, uh, a mashpia, a rav, a personal guide. So the, con the conjunction of the two gives you a, uh, a pretty solid system for getting guidance. Another thing I'll mention is the Rebbe once spoke in a sicha, Parshas Pinchas Tavshin Yud Aleph. So again, this is after the passing of the Rebbe's Rebbe. And in that sicha, Parshas Pinchas, Pinchas was the famous uh, vigilante. He took the law into his own hands when... There was a crisis, and Moshe didn't do anything, and Aaron didn't do anything. So, well, how could Pinchas stand up and do something? So, the Rebbe is discussing that, and uh, without repeating the whole sicha, basically, the Rebbe says there that sometimes Moshe Rabbeinu isn't going to tell you clearly what to do, but it's because you have a relationship with Moshe that you'll figure out on your own what Moshe would have told you, and for whatever reason, can't tell you, maybe because he wants you to figure it out on your own, the Rebbe said. That could, that could be one reason. He wants you to figure it out on your own. So the Rebbe said that explanation about Pinchas and Moshe, and then said, it's the same thing like in our day when someone writes to the Rebbe. Sometimes the Rebbe won't tell you clear. And nevertheless, writing to the Rebbe itself has a certain spiritual uh, effect where then you'll come to your own clarity. So... Remember, sometimes it's not that the Rebbe has to tell you something clearly, it's that you have to be ready <laughs> to listen, and then once you're ready to listen, you write to the Rebbe and you're completely open for what the Rebbe's going to answer, you'll suddenly get your own clarity. Now you're going to say, kind of a catch-22 is that. If I had my own clarity in the first place, why did I write to the Rebbe? <laughs> but this is precisely what I'm saying based on that Sikha from Pinchas Tavshin Yud Aleph. Maybe, just maybe, I could also... Um, offer the following story, and then I really need to get into uh, tonight's letter. There's a Yid, a Chosh of a Yid, a Rav, and uh, he's also a uh, psychologist by profession, Reb Tzvi Hersh Weinreb. And he lives most of the year in Yerushalayim. In fact, last time I was in Yerushalayim, I stayed with him. And uh, he's just a wonderful, wonderful person, a Talmud Chochem, and a warm and loving mentor and just a, a fantastic person. I met him in Johannesburg, or maybe it was in Cape Town, actually. We were in both cities. But I met him in Cape Town, that's right. And then Johannesburg, it was Gimel Thomas, the Rebbe's yard site. And I turned to him, and I said, uh, he, he insisted I call him Rebbe Heshi. I mean, <laughs> I mean, to me, he's Rebbe. Wine Rebbe. 
Rabbi Dr. Wein, Rabbi, he, he, he told me he's Heshi. So I said, Rabbi Heshi, it's Gimel Tamas, the Rebbe's yard site. You have to tell me your, your story with the Rebbe. So he tells me his story. <clears throat> I'll tell it very much Bikitzer. Uh Rabbi Weinreb was living in Crown Heights. This is back in the 60s, before Crown Heights was a predominantly Lubavitcher neighborhood. In fact, the Majitzer base Madrish was there, and his, his wife is a Majitzer. She's a Majitzer Tau. People ask me if I'm related to Majitz. I say, hear me sing for a couple notes. You'll realize I'm not related to Majitz. Anyways, um, so they were living in Crown Heights, and he had been, he said, maybe to one or two Fabrengans, not even the whole Fabrengan, but he said he'd, meaning the Rebbe's Fabrengans in 770, he said he'd never written to the Rebbe. It wasn't like he had any personal connection to the Rebbe. Because he lived in Crown Heights when he first got married, he stopped by 770. He heard the Rebbe speaking publicly a couple times. That was about the extent of uh, extent of his relationship. Anyways, uh, a couple years after they got married, they moved to Silver Spring, Maryland, and he was working there as a psychologist. And he was also um, giving shurim, giving high level classes uh, to Bnei Torah. And uh, really, he was a guy respected for everything—a Talmud Chacham and a, and a professional. And everyone went to him for advice. The problem is, when everyone goes to you for, for advice, who do you go to? So he said he had this crisis where he needed hadracha, he needed guidance. Yiddish kai questions, amuna, also practical stuff like being a husband, being a father, and he had no one to turn to. And he said he became very despondent. And he spoke to the smartest guy he knew, who was a nuclear physicist named uh, Naftali Berg, all of a shalom. <clears throat> and he said, you know, you're a smart guy, what do I do? So... Um, and Ibn Naftali told him, you got to go to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So Rabbi Weinreb didn't really know protocol. This is in the 60s. He could have had Yechidus if he wanted to. If he would have understood, that's how you do it. You call Maskiris, you call the Secretariat, you schedule a Yechidus for six months from now or 12 months from now or whatever it is. He didn't understand any of that. So Rabbi Weinreb just gets the number to 770 and he calls 770. <laughs> Somebody answers, yeah, hello, Veretta, who's speaking? And uh, Rabbi Weinreb says, Ayid von Maraland. Because he didn't want to say his name, because that was the whole thing. Remember, he was he was embarrassed that he had these questions. I'm supposed to be the guy with all the answers. Everyone comes to me for their questions. Who am I supposed to go to? How do I admit I even have these questions? So he didn't want to say his name, so he kept it anonymous. And when the, the person on the other line, who turned out to be Rabbi Chadukov, the Rebbe's chief secretary, asked him, Veretto, who's speaking here? So he said very specifically, he said, Ayid von Maryland, a Jew from Maryland. That's it. Totally anonymous. Okay. Was willst du? Chaba port fragen, ich will fragen. I want to ask some questions. Okay, can you fragen? You could ask. So he starts asking the questions. And a very strange thing's happening. As Rabbi Weinreb is asking the questions, Rabbi Chadukov is repeating it word for word out loud. It's a very strange way to carry on a conversation. At the end of the whole thing, he, f he finishes asking all of his questions. There's a silence. And he hears another voice in the background. And instantly recognizes this voice, this faint voice in the background speaking to Rabbi Chadakov. He realizes it's the Rebbe's voice. Remember, he had stopped in for parts of a couple of Fabrengen, so he knew the Rebbe's voice. And he hears the Rebbe's voice saying to Rabbi Chadakov, Azevier Ruft von Maraland, Zogema Safran in Maraland, Ayid Medvemenezo Redden, und Heister Weinreb. Since he's calling from Maryland, Tell him that there's a Jew in Maryland he should speak to, and his name is Weinreb. <laughs> you understand what was going on. Rabbi Weinreb was asking his questions. Rabbi Chadukov was repeating them out loud so that Rebbe would hear it like a human speakerphone. And the Rebbe was listening to all the questions, and at the end of all the questions, the Rebbe said, since he's calling from Maryland, tell him there's a Jew in Maryland he should speak to named Weinreb. Tell him to speak to Weinreb. So Weinreb was blown away. He's like, <laughs> he didn't know what to say. So Rabbi Chadakov was saying, hello, you know, hello. And Rabbi Weinweb was kind of silent. And, uh, and, he, and, he, and he said, did, did, uh, did you hear what the Rebbe said? He, he heard, but he couldn't believe it. So he said, I didn't hear. So Rabbi Chadakov repeated it and said, the Rebbe says, since you're calling from Maryland, you should speak to Weinweb. <laughs> Rabbi Weinweb says, Ich bin der Weinreb. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm Weinreb. I should. Rabbi Chadukov says, Ein minot weit. So hold on a second. Uh, now he's not sure what to do. So he says he hears Rabbi Chadukov turn to the Reb, all flustered, and say, As Eddie is der Weinreb. He's Weinreb. And he says he hears in the background the Reb 
totally taking it in stride and saying, Ebeze, Zolstem Zogen sein. Zol Ewissen sein. As a mole, darf man redden zu sich. If that is the case, he should be made to know that sometimes you got to speak to yourself. <laughs> and that was it. Your wine rep? Oh, good. So talk to wine rep. Speak to yourself. And that was the Rebbe's answer to Rabbi Weinreb. Sometimes you have to speak to yourself. So you're going to say, well, then I could have done that before I called the Rebbe. <laughs> but maybe that's the whole point. Maybe it's by making that connection to the tzaddik that we're able to re-encounter ourselves on a higher level. And we're able to find that clarity that we had all along, but maybe it was hidden from us. So I would encourage you that even when you're in a situation where you cannot get a direct answer from the Rebbe, just the commitment to writing has a spiritual power and will bring about clarity. And of course, again, I repeat, that's in conjunction with the Selech Harav. You have to have a mashpia and you have to speak to your mashpia. Okay. Uh, now we're over halfway through today's uh allotted time, and we haven't even started the letter. Here we go. Baruch Hashem, Yudalad Mar Cheshvan, Tov Shin Tes Vav, Brooklyn. The 14th day of the month of Cheshvan, 5715, Brooklyn. Havosik v'chosid ish yireya lekim nichbad v'nayla malachte melechas shamayim harav chayim mendel shiichye. Shalom of Racha. Who is this Reb Chayim Mendel? This is Reb Chayim Mendel Rosenberg, who was the mashkiach, the supervisor of the students, dean of students, maybe you would call it, at Yeshivas Toiras Emes in Yerushalayim. And that's very obvious from the context of the letter as we read on that his job was mashkiach in Yeshiva, and the Rebbe speaks about this explicitly, the role of a mashkiach in Yeshiva. Um, Toiras Emes was originally founded in Hebron. There's a Chabad history in Hebron, going back to the daughter of the Mitle Rebbe, the granddaughter of the, the Alter Rebbe, Rebbe Tzim Menuch HaRachel. So there's a long history of Chabad in, in Hebron. So Teres Emes was founded in 1911 in Hebron. And then when the First World War broke out, it had to move. And they relocated to Yerushalayim, and that's where they've been ever since, for well over a hundred years. And uh, Tatus Emes is an interesting yeshiva because I think we mentioned in earlier classes that the Rebbe Rashab started a yeshiva called Teim Chetimimim in Lubavitch, in the actual town of Lubavitch. Tatus Emes had its own name and it was not officially Teim Chetimimim. Teim Chetimimim was started in 1897 Teres Emes was started in 1911, so uh, what, 14 years later. But uh, spiritually, Teres Emes is sort of a, an affiliate or a branch, you could say, of Teim Chetimimim. And uh, the same spiritual model of a yeshiva that is meant for Bachram to excel both in Nigla and Nister, to study, of course, the bulk of the day, the bulk of the curriculum in Teim Chetimim and Teres Emes is learning Gemara and Halacha, learning the revealed portions of Torah, but also part of the yeshiva's schedule is to study Chesidus, the, uh, the Nister, the Torah. And uh, <coughs> both yeshivas are, are, were founded in that spirit, and founded by the same Rebbe, by the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Rebbe. At any rate, this letter was written, like all the letters we're, we're, we're learning, in 1954, the last few months of 1954, going into 1955. And this uh, Rabbi Rosenberg, who was the Mashkiach in Teres Emes, this was his first year. Now, he continued with the Yeshiva until his passing in Tavshin Nun Zayin. Okay, you're talking about 1997. So he was there for uh, over 40 years, 
as the Mashkiach in Yeshiva, but this letter was written to Rabbi Rosenberg in his first year on the job. So he was a relatively young man at the time, and just sort of, I guess, learning the ropes as a Mashkiach in Yeshiva. Okay. Bemaina al Michtove Meches Mar an answer to your letter from the 8th of Mar Cheshvan. That's a pretty fast turnaround, by the way. From the 8th of Cheshvan to the 14th of Cheshvan, when you're talking about 1954, mail coming back and forth from uh, Eretz Yisro. Hine Yehirotzin, Hashem Yisborech, Shiatzlich, Bemalachas Shemayim, Hashkocha al Tamida Yeshivas Teres Amis. Hashem should grant that you should be successful in your holy work, in your heavenly work which is a mashkiach, a supervisor. And we're going to talk a little bit, that's a clumsy translation, we'll talk a little bit more about the role of a mashkiach in yeshiva. Uh, it, Hashem should grant you success in your heavenly work as the mashkiach in the yeshiva Titus Amis. Okay. As we're going to see from the letter, a mashkiach is not a an instructor. I mean, they may also be, but typically it's a separate job. It's not an instructor, someone who teaches a class. The mashkiach is more involved in supervising the students in their general conduct, in their life, in their, even in the dormitories, in, 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 in times when they're eating, um, you know, even really mundane things. And especially, you know, then goes without saying, times like davening, the mashkiach would supervise davening times to make sure that the, the bachram are, are praying the way they need to pray. But it's not an instructor role where he, you get up in front of a class and you give a lecture and you, you, you teach a subject. Okay. Strong statement here. The Rebbe says, it is known, it's already known, that the responsibility of a mashkiach is disproportionately many times greater than the responsibility of other teachers in yeshiva. <laughs> When I read this, by the way, I was thinking, you know, every Yom Tov when the Rebbe would say a sicha about, let's say, Purim. So Purim is the most important Yom Tov in the whole year. And then you learn a sicha about Pesach. Pesach is the most important Yom Tov in the whole year. Because whatever it is the Rebbe is speaking about, the Rebbe brings out the uniqueness of that thing. So here, the Rebbe is writing to a, to a mashkiach and says, you know that a mashkiach's job is so much bigger than that of the Rosh Hashiva. I'm sure if the Rebbe wrote to a Rosh Hashiva, the Rebbe would bring out the greatness of and the uniqueness of being a Rosh Hashiva. But here, <coughs> the Rebbe is writing to a Mashkiach, and he says, we know the responsibility of the Mashkiach is so much greater than that of a Rosh Hashiva. Why? Very interesting logic here. <laughs> because the teachers, their job is to teach the students Torah. kolkach <laughs> ma'alumazeh. The other side, meaning spiritually, the opposing side, the, the Yetzirah, doesn't give so much disturbance against learning Torah. Now, that's an interesting statement, because you would think, yeah, the Yetzirah, its whole job is to disturb you from learning Torah. The Rebbe says, eh, well, relatively speaking, no. The Yetzirah doesn't bother you from learning Torah so much. Why not? Kevin Shah Torah, he lechem in the First of all, Taita is likened to the manna that fell from heaven. It's, it's bread from heaven, as opposed to bread from earth. And the words of Taita do not receive impurity. They're like fire, which does not receive impurity. That on their own, Taita itself is pure. It has, no, it has no dross or any leftovers. So Taita is pure, and it's almost like the Yetzirah can't touch it. It can't mess with it. So also, from the perspective of the student, precisely because Torah is so lofty and pristine, sometimes it doesn't, it, it's not so relevant to the student. In other words, the student can learn Torah and not really internalize it. And so it's not really doing its job. It's not really affecting the student. And so the Yetzirah says, oh, let him learn. It's not affecting him anyway. The Torah is remaining so holy and so lofty that it's not affecting this guy. Ah, leave him alone. He's doing my job already. The Rebbe doesn't want to finish the statement there, but he quotes a uh, saying of our sages that if somebody learns Torah in the wrong way, instead of being a samchayim, an elixir of life, it can become a sammovis. It can become a deadly poison. 
So, in other words, the Yitzhahara looks at the guy learning and says, look, the, the, the Torah is pure and holy. I can't mess with it. That's first of all. But as far as how it affects this guy, maybe precisely because the Torah is so pure and holy, it's going to remain abstract in this guy's life. He won't internalize it. And therefore, there's no threat to me, the Yitzhahara says. And you know what? Even if he does internalize it, maybe he'll internalize it with the wrong motives, with ulterior motives, and then he'll turn it into poison, God forbid, and then also the Yitzhahara says, he's doing my job. So in a lot of ways, the Yitzhahara sort of leaves people alone when it comes to learning Torah. Okay. Mashen ke natso ala mashkiach lirei shahatayda talam dehu. The mashkiach's whole job is not to teach the, the lessons, but to oversee and facilitate the personal growth of the students so that the Torah that they learn is affecting them. So you understand, it's like the Rosh Hashiva comes in and gives a beautiful shir. And maybe it didn't touch anyone. Maybe it didn't, didn't make a dent. The Mashkiach then comes in behind. He has the sort of, no, you know, the, 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 the unglorious job, the unglamorous job of coming in and working with the students to get them sensitive, to get them primed, so whatever the, the Rosh Hashiva taught them, they actually will internalize and it will affect them in a real way. Well, for that, the Yetzirah is going to put up a resistance. So <laughs> the Rebbe tells this Meshkiah, the Yetzirah is going to leave the Rosh Hashiva alone, but he's going to come for you, because <laughs> the Rosh Hashiva is not a threat to his job. Your job as Meshkiah is a threat to the Yetzirah's job as Yetzirah. So you got to understand how big your responsibility is. All right. That when you learn Torah, you should become united with it until it's called your Torah. By the way, that's a Gemara in Kiddushin that talks about why is a Tamar Chochem able to be Meichel on his Kovit? Because seemingly if it's Kovit a Torah, he, ha he has no right to be Meichel. He has no right to forego the, the, the honor due to a Torah scholar. But the Gemara in Kedushin says that it's because Torah say it becomes his Torah, I mean the Torah of the person, that when you really learn it, when you not just understand it intellectually, but you take it personally, now it becomes yours, and if it's yours, well then you, you have the right to forego the honor due to yourself for having learned Torah that way. And he was like, that's a, that's a Gemara. Der Eisvisrokulechad or like the language of the Zohar, to use the mystical term, that Torah and the Jewish people are entirely one. Now, latently, inherently, that's an underlying truth at all times, that Yisrael, Araisev, Ekut Shebrecho, Kul Echad. But here we're talking about on a revealed level, that the Jews should become one with the Torah. The Rosh Hashiva might give you a great class, and you might be smart, and if you're smart, you can repeat back the class. It doesn't, be, it doesn't mean you became one with the Torah. The Mashkiach comes in and makes sure that you're taking it personally, now you're becoming one with the Torah. Against this, the Yetzirah is going to fight. And the Yetzirah is going to bring with him his body, the animal soul, to help him. But with all his might. I want to just tell you a quick story. I know we're running out of time, but Pesach is coming, and I don't want to scare anyone with that or make anyone turn off the shear and go uh, start cleaning. But I'll tell you a very interesting story that happened in Tem Chetamimim. Since we mentioned at the beginning of this year, the year, the Rebbe Shab started the issue called Tem Chetamimim. So the, <clears throat> the Rebbe Shab's son, the Fyodik Rebbe, who was in turn the Rebbe's father-in-law, was the uh, Menahel, he was the, the uh, administrator of the yeshiva, and uh, they, the Rebbe Rashab and the Fedek Rebbe, the fifth and sixth Rebbe, were involved in admissions. And one time, this Bacha came to be admitted into the yeshiva, and he was very, very talented, he was very smart, he was very learned, so on paper, he should have been a shoe in for admissions. But uh, the Fidik Rebbe told his father, after they were finished with the interview, the, the, the Rebbe Shab said, what do you think about him? The Fidik Rebbe said that, you know, he, he's not edel. He's lacking character refinement. So I don't know what to do with him. So the Rebbe Shab said, we could work that out. So what did they do? Pesach was coming. So they took this bacher and they gave him every job that has to be done to get ready for Pesach. They made him clean out the whole yeshiva. And then the night of Erev Pesach, he had to do B'dikas Chametz, and he had the Kashra, the Kalim. And then, actually, the day of Erev Pesach, they, they made him, there's a minig that some have, to bake matzah Erev Pesach 
after Chatzos, the high pressure situation. So he had to oversee that as well. Basically, they knocked him out. <laughs> and uh, by the end of Pesach, the Rebbe Rashab said to the Friedrich Rebbe, says, look at the Bachar. And he looked at him. He said, how does he look? He says, completely different. His face changed. He said, yeah, you see what Zayesh el Mitzvah can do? <laughs> the sweat of a Mitzvah? In other words, <clears throat> I'm telling you this story because here was a Bachar that intellectually who was a great student already. And the discussion was about his character. I think we forget that a lot of times in yeshiva, that we focus on academic performance, that, that <clears throat> especially you know, with, with Bachram, who are able to achieve uh, in advanced studies and we're very impressed with their mental acumen and, and we feel like, oh, that's the end all be all. But it, it, it's really not. It's, the ultimate is internalization and taking it personally and how the moichen affects midas, how what you know in your brain will affect the sensitivity of your heart. So and anyways, that's a story that ended up well, where a boy who was very smart also became emotionally refined as well. But this is what the Rebbe is saying to Rabbi Rosenberg, that <clears throat> you're, the, you're the one who makes that happen. The Rosh Hashiva is giving lessons. Okay, great. The Yitzhak is leaving him alone. But you're the one making sure that the Torah the Bacham are learning is actually changing them on a personal level. I'll tell you one more Temchen Tamim story, because why not? Um, and I want to thank the Duchman family for this, especially my friend Zalman Duchman. I, uh, I knew I'd seen somewhere in, there's a wonderful saver called uh, L'Shema Eisen, and uh, the diaries <clears throat> of Zalman Duchman. And uh, so I knew that the, the Rebbe asked him to write. So I knew there was something there about a samavar, or something like a, a hot kettle or an urn in Teim Chetimimim. So I, I asked uh, Rabbi Duchman to find it for me, and he pulled it right up and sent it to me. The deal was there was an oven, like a big oven, and attached to the oven, not a separate piece, but like built into the oven, there was a, a, like a kettle where people would get hot water <coughs> as a, an urn for tea. At any rate... Uh, there's a din in Shulchan Aruch, uh, that water that stays in a metal container overnight is uh, not so good. Anyways, that metal container, because it was bolted or soldered, I don't know how it was attached, but it was attached to this massive oven. So it was like mechuber lekarka, so to speak. It, 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 you couldn't ever empty out the urn because it was attached to this big giant oven. So there was always a little bit of water that would stay at the bottom, and therefore that water would stay overnight. So there were certain Bachram and Temchetimim who wouldn't drink tea because they didn't want to take the hot water from that urn because there was a little bit of water there that stayed overnight. Anyways, <clears throat> the, the, the Friedrich Rebbe found out about this. Like I said, he was the Manal of the Shiva, and... Uh, he found out about it, and he secretly, he asked undercover, you know, and we shouldn't make a big deal about it, but get me the names. Who are these Bachram? Because <laughs> this is very, this is very nice to hear. This is very nice news that these Bachram are being so scrupulous, being so stringent. Again, this is my point. You know, you could be a Tamil Chacham, you could excel in, 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 in your studies, but that's in the classroom. There's something called being a mensch and being Yerei Shamayim and the Chosid outside of the classroom. And that's what the Rebbe is telling Rabbi Rosenberg. Your job as Meshkiach <coughs> is that, the, the whole person, the complete person, the whole package of Yerei Shamayim and sensitivity, not just academic prowess. Okay, let's finish up here. Now, the Rebbe built up how scary big this job is. <laughs> That's it. I'm retiring. Remember, I mean, Rosenberg started this year. <laughs> Maybe after su such a letter, after you read that, what, the Yetzirah is coming for me? Forget about it. <laughs> Let me see if the Rosh Hashiva will switch jobs with me. I, I don't need this pressure. So then the Rebbe says to him, Avokaven she kemaymer azal, afilo reish gargusa harimin shemaya ko mimanalei, since we know from the Gemara, Bava Basra, uh, Daf Tzadik Aleph, Omid Beis, that even the warden of a well, it's used there as the example of a very minor job. Like, imagine a guy who, he's not, he's not the governor, he's not the mayor, he's not even on the city council. What's his position of authority? He watches the neighborhood well. 
it's a very low level. This, this is like on, on the level of like hall monitor. Okay, it's like <laughs> a very low level of of, of authority. And the Gemara Bava Basar says that even someone who has this low level job, that his appointment came from heaven. That in heaven they they decide, oh, this guy should have this job. The Rebbe said this Maimed Azal many, many, many times, uh, which was basically the idea that if you were given some type of empowerment, if you have a job, this didn't just happen randomly. From heaven, they decided to put you into this job. So even the watchman of a well was was given that uh, job from heaven. So how much more so? That you were given the power to carry out this job of mashkiach, which is a heavenly appointment. You were appointed from on high. The Rebbe would always say this to people who were like disgruntled. Of, I don't want to say that Rebbe never let somebody out of a job they didn't like. But most of the time, the Rebbe would say to them, this is no mistake that you have this this job. This was from from heaven. They appointed you. And even the watchman of a well is appointed from heaven. So again, the Rebbe is saying here to Rabbi Rosenberg, it's a tough job being Mashkiach. And the Yitzhah is going to resist what you're doing because what you're doing is so powerful and so important in the lives of these boys. But I want you to know, you have what it takes because you are selected. They appointed you from heaven to be this Mashkiach and Teres Emes. And nothing counts here except for your goodwill. If you're going to have the right attitude, you're going to succeed. Don't worry. Hashem should make you successful. That in a very short time, you're going to be able to say, Look at the products which I grew. Meaning, you're going to be able to point to your students with pride and say, this, this is the fruits of all my hard work. Look at these, look at these students. Uh, here's the PS. It is superfluous <coughs> to mention, says the Rebbe. Like, I don't even need to mention, but the Rebbe is mentioning. That just like when it comes to physical health, even when we're talking about the body's health, mitzat atzmei, the physical body, in the most material sense of the word. The physical body becomes enlivened, it becomes healthier when the spirituality of the neshama is shining through it. Okay, you can't have physical health without spiritual health, even in the most simple, literal sense of physical health. Kainhu, so too, and in the case of your job of educating young men, when you're talking about the body of Torah and the soul of Torah, we mentioned before, they study Nigla and Nister, the revealed and the secret areas of Torah. That means the legalistic and the mystical. So the legalistic is called the body of Torah, like learning Gemara, and then the soul of Taita is learning Chsidis, Kabbalah, Pinimiyas Taita. So the Rebbe says, just like with a physical body, the physical body is healthier when the spirit is present in it and shining through it. So too, you have to remember the importance of that even in Nigla, there has to be Nister. In other words, when they're learning Chsidis, Okay, so there's, there's, there's times for learning Chsidis in the Yeshiva schedule. Like I said, the, the bulk of the day uh, is is learning Gemara, like at any yeshiva. But there are certain set times for learning chassidus. But the Rebbe is saying is, even in the times when they're learning nigla, that is infused. That study of the body of the Torah is infused with the 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 spirit, with the soul of the Torah, and that you should be attentive to that, so that there's that uh, that extra sensitivity, that extra call it the um, fear of heaven that is infused only through studying the, the areas of Torah which are what we call hidden or the inner dimensions or what we simply refer to as chassidus. Okay, we went a little bit over time. I apologize for that and we'll see you tomorrow night for a double shear. Thursday nights our double classes, Lechem Mishnah, to get ready to take us into Shabbos. 
See you tomorrow night.